So I'm going to introduce um, Robert Jamison. So Professor Robert Jamison um, is basically um, one of Australia's leading eye genetic uh, uh, clinicians and researchers. Um, she's um, at the University of Sydney, leads the eye genetics mm -hmm. research unit and leads the Eye Genetics Centre at the Children's Hospital Westmead. So that's quite, a, that's quite a large responsibility of researchers and clinicians across um, Central and Western Sydney. Um, <coughs> she's also, um, you know, she's been there for a long time and she's, but, uh, she's the head of discipline of Genetic Medicine University of Sydney. Mm -hmm. So she's worked in um, both Sydney and the UK and you've studied quite extensively overseas, I understand. And she came back to Australia specifically to set up um, a lot of these uh, research and clinic units uh, at the Children's Hospital Westmead. Um, and, you know, um, I think that um, you're very, we're all very privileged to have her here today. So I'd like to introduce Professor Robin Jamison. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much, Matt. So. I might use this one. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, and it's really lovely to be here today. And it's great to see some sunshine there. So beautiful. Um, so I'm going to talk about some uh, ophthalmology research updates. And that's um, mainly in the areas of um, genetics and genomics. Um, so I'm going to uh, talk about some of the... Um, uh, the ways that we go about this in terms of the um, genomics um, research and then the ways that we go about working towards um, some of the treatments in these conditions. So you can see on the slide there how really we always, um, it's uh, very uh, patient and family focused. So we're always starting off with the patient and the family and thinking what would be the most relevant um, for this particular family in terms of any um, research that would be useful to undertake um, in both a genomic sense and then other research strategies that can be taken. Um, so that's the first bit on the left, left there. Um, and then you might have heard about um, there's quite a revolution happened um, in genomics. Uh, you might have heard of next generation sequencing, whole genome sequencing, exome sequencing. All of these um, approaches uh, have just been revolutionary for people with um, genetic eye diseases because um, there's been um, a lot of possible um, genes causing these problems. But up until very recently, we've had no way of being able to access uh, that information. And it's with these um, technological changes that we can now access that information. And so that then opens the door for genetic diagnosis uh, and help for families in that regard, and also uh, to other treatment strategies, uh, thinking about other ways that we might treat things by uh, working in um, gene editing, for instance, which is a very uh, new and exciting field, which uh, does have significant prospects uh, in eye diseases. And it also leads on to other um, stem cell-based approaches, potentially um, pharmacological approaches and so on, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a moment. So just some quick background information for people who mightn't have um, genetics uh, uh, 101. <laughs> so basically, um, all the cells in our, in our bodies contain something that's called chromosomes, and it's on those that the genes lie. And the genes code for the proteins, and it's the proteins that then make our bodies in all of their parts um, as we see them then. So you need, you need genes and um, proteins to make all the parts of your bodies, eyes, brain, heart, kidneys, everything. Um, and that's a lot of data on those genes, uh, three billion base pairs, so three gigabytes of data to, uh, to make us the way we are. So it's a really um, complex process. Um, so some of the um, genetic eye diseases, and this isn't by any means a complete list, but just to give you some examples, so um, conditions such as uh, congenital cataracts, you can see there in the middle, particularly affecting uh, the lens, that can be associated with problems with glaucoma, um, also problems at the front part of the eye called anterior segment dysgenesis or Peters anomaly, there's various uh, names there. Um, and also they often tend to have problems with glaucoma as well. 
Um, and then a whole swathe of conditions affecting the back of the eye. Um, retinitis pigmentosa is just one of those, cone dystrophies and so on and so forth. And of course, there's others, there's corneal diseases, there's, there's lots of others as well, um, but they're just some um, examples. So why are we um, interested potentially uh, in genomics and, and finding a genetic diagnosis for those eye conditions that are, particularly do have a genetic cause? One of the reasons is it can be helpful for families in understanding uh, what the chances are for them having another affected child with a similar condition or for an affected adult, what the chances are for them uh, of having an affected child themselves. Uh, because often without a genetic diagnosis, um, as for this person, um, this is a family tree. You can see here, this person here, when they're affected person, um, that's why they're coloured in there, um, when they're thinking about having a child, uh, a lot of these conditions, you, you don't know if it's going to be a really a very low risk uh, or if it's going to be a risk uh, in the vicinity of uh, a one in two chance. And that, that is related to the underlying genetic cause, if it happens to be a genetic um, condition. So getting a genetic diagnosis can be really useful in sorting that out and having an understanding uh, of those sorts of issues. And the other reason is because if we understand the genetic cause, then that can um, help us understand how the problem has come about, what's actually caused the problem, and then that's a step towards developing a treatment potentially for the problem. Um, and you might have heard about um, gene therapy. So in some cases of uh, the retinal dystrophies, there is quite a bit of progress happening uh, towards uh, gene and uh, stem cell based therapies in these condition conditions. And again, that's all facilitated by understanding the underlying genetic cause. So um, only very recently, genetic testing uh, has potentially become available in these conditions. As I mentioned, there's been enormous um, difficulties because of the number of genes that can cause these problems and our lack of uh, technology to actually uh, be able to access that information. But with these new technological breakthroughs, we can do things um, like uh, next generation sequencing, whole genome sequencing, whole exome sequencing, and then look. Um, so in a person, for instance, who might have these types of conditions, the congenital cataracts, Peter's anomaly, microphthalmia, we can look for some of these known um, disease genes. So there's probably around about 100 known disease genes for those conditions. Um, and uh, so when we use these sorts of um, new strategies, we can um, find the answer in about 40 to 70 percent of patients, depending on the particular type of condition itself. So there's still a lot of research work to be done in this area. We, are, we don't know all the genetic answers for all these conditions yet, but this is certainly uh, way better than it was, you know, say five to ten years ago when we were thinking maybe five percent of cases we might be able to find the answer for. And similarly with the retinal dystrophy, so the RP, cone dystrophy, labor congenital amaurosis, and there, of course, are many, there are many others. But again, this has been a really uh, difficult problem, over 200 known disease genes, um, and again, around about a 40 to 70 percent detection rate, depending uh, which exact particular condition uh, it is. So again, um, can't find all the answers, but can find answers in certainly a significant proportion of cases much better than five to ten years ago. Um, and this clinical testing is now available in Australia. We've set this up at the Children's Hospital at Westmead in the laboratory um, there, the uh, clinical service testing laboratory there. Um, so if this is something that you are interested in, the thing to do is get a referral to your local clinical genetics service. Um, and that's the website there where you can find out where your nearest genetic service um, is. Uh, and then um, they will talk through with you the various issues and things to consider um, and that you may need further detailed ophthalmic review uh, for the particular um, individual uh, because that can be really helpful in interpreting the testing um, as well. 
So because the testing is not, so genetic and genomic testing is not, uh, uh, it's not uh, just like, it's not just like a full blood count test where you quickly get a haemoglobin level. Um, there's a huge amount of work uh, required um, because um, the um, underlying genome, we've got three gigabytes of data. We have to, that has to be sequenced at, at 30 times, as it were, uh, to get the enough, enough, what's called enough reads to be able to interpret the information. So that gets to be 90 gigabytes of data for one person to be analysing. So it's a huge amount of data to sift through. And these are all of the steps that have to happen to sift through that data. And so in some cases, um, we're looking uh, at at known disease genes, and certainly as a clinical test, we're looking at known disease genes and trying to find the answer in, in that way, indicated here. Um, and then uh, what we're often doing then is if people want to be involved in research, if we don't find an answer in the known disease genes, then we go on to be looking to see if we can find the novel disease causing genes in that particular family. Of course, this is um, not something that happens overnight. Even for to get to this stage takes in the vicinity of around eight to ten months because there are a lot of genes to look at. Each gene has around 20 parts. Each part has about 400 dot points, um, and each one has to be uh, examined. So it's it does take a, a fair while, a long time, uh, but it can give answers, as I said, uh, in a majority of cases. Um, and then, of course, uh, so looking for novel disease genes is, of course, another a low level as well, which also takes a long time. But we have found answers uh, in some cases as well with that. Um, so, and just um, to understand that uh, genetic testing is not always uh, a complete uh, straight up uh, lay down Mazaire. Sometimes we have to think about is that making sense in terms of what the patient uh, uh, understands their phenotype to be? Do we have to go back to the ophthalmologist and say, hmm, well, we thought it was um, uh, this, retinitis pigmentosa, for instance, but could it be some other type of retinal dystrophy on the basis of what we're finding on the genetic testing? And so I'm just giving one particular uh, example here. So this was a 39 year old male who came with his partner interested to know um, what the genetic cause, so what the risks were for future um, children. He'd had um, night blindness from about the age of 15 years. Um, and and his, he had a, a diagnosis of retinitis pigmentosa. When we did the genetic testing, because you're looking at around 200 genes, you can actually pick up changes uh, that might be considered to be disease causing in more than one gene. And in his case, in fact, we did, you can see. So genes, there were three genes identified which had potential uh, pathogenic changes that we then had to work through to work out which was actually the one. And part of that working through process involved examination of his siblings um, and examination of his parents. Um, and also testing uh, of his parents as well, just to work out um, how things were segregating and so to understand which was a particular disease gene. And in fact, in this case, um, his, his ophthalmic diagnosis got changed because he had a particular type of a retinal dystrophy that wasn't retinitis pigmentosa, it was another type of retinal dystrophy. So that sort of thing can happen as well. So it's, it's refining the diagnosis and understanding the genetic cause at the same time. So then from a, a research level, the sorts of things that we're going on to do then, um, so once we've um, got worked out the genomic uh, side of things, often we're wanting to take a skin biopsy um, from people. And uh, what you can do with this skin biopsy, and I'll just go on to the next slide, you can actually turn that a person's um, skin sample into what's called induced pluripotent stem cells. So that can make the skin into a stem cell, which means that can be differentiated to any type of cell in the body. Now, of course, in our case, we want to differentiate that to, um, to uh, parts of the eye. For instance, you can see there, those cells can be differentiated into a little optic cup, so the little, um, like a little eye eyeball. Um, or what's called the retinal pigment epithelium, which is at the back part of the eye. And the reason that that's helpful 
is that it can help in understanding how that gene is causing the problem, how that uh, change in the gene is causing the problem, because we can uh, do um, scientific assays on these samples and understand how that uh, particular genetic cause could have caused the problem and then work towards understanding how we might be able to afford a treatment in that uh, particular situation. And so um, the other exciting thing that's happened and that's really um, very uh, on the frontiers for, um, for uh, from the research perspective is that we're then able to use gene editing, it's called CRISPR, um, gene editing to actually make changes to um, particular genes. So for instance, um, at the back of the eye, what we're working towards being able to do is, for instance, in a person with a retinal dystrophy, um, use these types of uh, gene editing strategies and change the genes in the back of the eye so that we take away the mutant gene and put it, putting in a normal gene to uh, improve the function of the actual eye cells in that person. Of course, that's a huge uh, leap, um, and we're using actually the mouse, you can see a little mouse there, uh, the mouse uh, as a model system for these types of strategies. So this is actually a little mouse having electrophysiology. Some people might be familiar with electrophysiology. We can do electrophysiology in the mouse. Um, and then this is, um, you might have had, o people might have known of OCT, that's where you look at the layers at the back of the retina. So this is actually a little mouse there having OCT as well. So this is all research, of course, um, and we're um, modelling particular genetic changes uh, in the mouse to understand how they're causing the problem. The mouse is actually quite a good model system for the human eye and then working on treatments that will help the mice with the aim being that they will then help humans uh, in, the, in the future. Uh, and then these are particular, these are particular um, vectors that are used to introduce uh, any particular gene therapy and we're working on strategies to make those more specific and focused for the particular eye cells that we would be wanting to focus on in the back of the eye. So just, um, so that gives you a summary of the kind of various scientific aspects that are happening. There's another project that we're involved with at the moment because of course uh, all of these things, uh, genetic diagnosis, um, they're new tests, um, these new therapies, they're going to be new genetic therapies. Uh, governments of course are uh, worried about how, how these things might be costly and so on and so forth. But as we all know there are huge costs. Uh, uh, social and economic costs associated with the impact of these conditions. And so it's part of our research strategy as well to be making the case in this regard. So we currently have a new project starting which is the health economic study of uh, genetic ocular disease and we are um, ascertaining some of these issues. It's not really done very well uh, in the current literature in terms of what are the economic um, and social costs for people for um, the diagnosis of their condition but also the lifetime costs associated with that. Um, and then um, we are comparing that, looking at that in conjunction with, well, what's the cost of the diagnostic um, strategies that are undertaken and what would be the health benefits and economic benefits of treatment of these conditions and weighing those things up in an economic sense. So this is, this is um, a start of this study, so you may be contacted um, to fill in surveys and so on related to this study in terms of, because we really want to understand what are the costs for people so that we can work on this formula which will be able to inform government then uh, once we want to get on to new diagnoses and uh, therapy strategies for people. Um, so this is the journey then that we're on uh, with the whole aim to have improved diagnosis and treatments uh, for these conditions. So I'll just put that up there, um, just that's just a reminder of the genetic services um, in New South Wales, the website there to um, to be able to contact your local genetic service if you would like to. Um, and I look forward to speaking with some of you later today and I hope that um, this is helpful. I think we'll be able to answer questions later as needed. All right, thank you.